They say about 27 Nigerian languages are close to extinction. And that, I think, is a very, very conservative estimate. The United Nations Scientific and Cultural Organization, uh, UNESCO, that's United Nations Scientific Education and Cultural Organization, he, it it's identifies a lot of languages that are close to extinction, even on the African continent. And today, we want to have a conversation about all of this. How can we save our languages from going into extinction? What should we do? And on this show, we have someone that is going to do justice to that. Aquaya TV is a station that deals with history, culture, arts, and how they relate to our development. And my name is Odo Diego Okenyodo. With me in the studio is an artist, a poet, uh, a writer, someone who also, you know, deals in language. And she's going to um, have this conversation with us in a few minutes. Her name is Salamatu Sule. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, viewers. You do a lot using language um, and you are concerned about the survival of language. Why are you this concerned? Well, I'm quite very concerned because like you rightly said, 27 languages are fast being endangered and they face um, sudden extinction. And if we're not very careful, we might have more languages being endangered. As you can see, Nigeria is upside down at the moment with the whole plague of um, communal clashes, with the whole issues of uh, um, banditry and what have you. So a lot of people are shying away from even trying to say, yes, I want to identify with my culture as a Fulani girl, and I want to speak it confidently in the society, but because of all of this negativity around, so I do not really want to allow people to know, for example, that I'm a Fulani girl for it, for instance. So that might raise some red flag with regards to how much more can my language survive in the future. That's number one. Number two, even in our writings, we're not also very consistent in terms of also trying to sell our language to the world. Mm. We just want to continue writing in the, that um, uh, English form to, mm. you know, promote uh, the English narrative. But whereas we forget our culture and our culture is dying and the languages are fast, fast going on the extinct. So for me, it's a cause for worry yeah. because we need to begin to save it before it dies. Mm. And if we don't, we might have ourselves to blame. That's it. It's interesting that you bring in the issue of um, security there, where also there are displacements of people. There are many internally displaced people yes. uh, relocating to mingle with another culture. And um, somehow, you know, they want to blend in to be, able to be allowed to stay. Mm. So they will have to now start picking up the languages yeah. of the new locations. Yes. So that's it. For me, you see, the whole idea of assimilation is yeah. what we're seeing now. And um, for some, it's not going to be difficult to assimilate because everyone is struggling to be identified with the location where they find themselves. One of it is the IDPs. Yeah. We have IDPs all over the country now and uh, they fear that very soon they face another kind of uh, displacement so yeah. they would rather want to pick up a people's language so that they can further be identified with that people whereas they've lost their houses they've lost their parents they can't yes. go back and even if they go back they won't be going back with the kind of languages they were speaking before because mm. they have associated with another mm. um, environment. Yeah. They've picked up new languages and most of their languages will begin to, I mean, 
be fade away. Yes. yes, and by the time that happens, the, there will be a cause for concern because um, there will be the need for uh, another kind of reorientation and uh, how to get back those lost languages. It's actually mm. very painful because it's like you've also lost your c culture, you've lost your identity, and uh, I mean, what is the, uh, I, I recall a book by Prof, the Professor Ibrahim James about the languages um, and cultures in southern Kaduna. And there are about 70, or there were about 70 languages or so when that book was written. But so you can imagine, yeah. go back to Kaduna now. So how many uh, of such 70 languages will you be meeting there? Very few, because especially in the southern part, yeah. Um, languages like Ikulu. Uh, I haven't uh, heard that okay, before. Okay, <laughs> there's Ikulu, there's uh, Kagoro, which actually is Agwarok. Uh, there's um, Baju, there's uh, the Kaninkong, there's the... Uh, so there are quite a number of languages, and the speakers are very few. Oh, yeah. And those are the category that UNESCO classifies as critically endangered languages. Very true. In... Um, Taraba State, there's the Bate, uh, the Bete, mm. uh, in um, uh, in um, so there are a number of languages that are, you know, essentially gone because they only have less than three thousand speakers, and because they have less than three thousand speakers, those three thousand people cannot be interacting with themselves because they need to trade, they need to have um, religious worship. They need to go to schools, and they cannot just engage in these activities with themselves alone. Yeah. And that's how the languages are going. You speak Igala. Do you speak it? Are you confident that you, you can speak it very well? Okay, so that's the thing. I sp so most of the time, I'm translating Igala. Mm like the Englishman. So for example, if you say opaipo, mm. meaning granite oil. Mm. So you see, I said opaipo, mm -hmm. bringing the granite first, just like the Englishman. Opa. Well, that's, it's supposed to be epo opa. Okay. Opa is what? O opa is granite. Okay. Epo. <laughs> is uh, so oil. Like the like, Ekpo is in, is oil in Yoruba too. Yeah, so Ekpo comes before Opa. Mm -hmm. That is the traditional way to mm -hmm. pronounce it, Epo Opa. Mm -hmm. But because I'm here now, most of the time I struggle to say okay, Opa Ekpo okay. instead of Ekpo Opa. Okay. So you can see how my igala is fast fading away, mm. and then sometimes I have to struggle to also ask, did I speak it well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's, this is just me now because I am researching this. Yeah. How many more people are even willing to do the language question? To yeah. say, okay, I really need to keep pace with my language. Mm. I really need to travel home once in a while to collect some of these proverbs, mm -hmm. to write or to do code switching from English to my language so that readers can also understand these languages yeah. but we're not doing any of this or even if we're doing it we're just few doing it so yeah. code mixing and code switching is something that i think can also help language to be documented in a way what it's is code mixing what is code <laughs> switching that's something yeah. like uh, some <laughs> so dj's thing yeah. <laughs> so in linguistic we have code mixing where you speak uh english and then uh, you mix it with uh, aquaya, for example. Mm -hmm. And then we have in another way where you start with English and then you switch over okay. to aquaya. Okay. So you're speaking like, okay, I want to speak like Igala or Roka. Mm -hmm. How are you doing today? Mm. So I'm mixing. But when I'm speaking English and I say, how are you today? So today we're doing this. And I said, so Onale, we did that. Mm. So you can see I am switching and... Uh, okay. So okay. they're related. They're very similar, but they're different. So I think 
code switching and code mixing is something that we also need to uh, I mean bring into our writing because it helps to also promote languages mm. and it helps the reader to research some of these languages they, mm. they don't necessarily have to be Akweya or Igala or Bagi mm. but they also just blend with it and try to understand one or two things about every other languages mm. apart from there so the whole idea of migration now like we've talked with the IDPs also has uh, a great role to play in the language extinction and but also again it's do I say a blessing in disguise for some persons who will be learning new languages mm. I mean from environmental changes and all of that mm. so I, I mean like I see areas where people should have a project around now you know going into the IDP camps and capturing stories these stories of trauma Mm. You know, and people may be saying them in the languages, the, the original languages. Mm -hmm. um, then maybe you can subtitle or translate uh, or transliterate or whichever. Yeah, so I think uh, this is something that Aquea TV can do. Mm. Like going to these IDPs, collecting songs, like mm. folk songs, mm. um, that has to um, also do with their kind of traumas mm. and all of that and to also see how much language they can also document. This helps not just the speaker of the language, it mm. also helps for uh, future research and all of that for mm. these people who have lost their languages to be able to trace back, mm. or maybe for their children to be able to trace back some of these, their languages. Mm. I wish we had technology during, our, I mean, great-grandfather's time, I mean, there would have been some hunter songs that I would have liked, loved, loved to collect, mm. some proverbs that I would have loved to collect because the way the market woman sings mm. is different from the way the blacksmith sings and the hunter songs as well. So those are the things that I think from now on we still have opportunity to collect some of this. So there can be a project around this and I don't know how interested UNESCO will be yeah. for this because uh, it's going to also attract some fundings to travel to some of this uh, environment. Apart from the fact that you also have the opportunity to capture some of these areas yeah. because they will go on the extinct mm -hmm. as well yeah. because of the, the crisis. So yeah. if you go to Goza, for example, uh, I mean, they're not really uh, like idol worshippers now. So... I won't be saying, maybe you won't see the, uh, the stool of the chief priest and mm. all of that. But there are also some places like in Benue States that you may not be finding some of these things again. So, And I think if there's an opportunity to do so now, it's something that we can collect the languages and collect some of the cultural practices, their dance and all of that, and mm -hmm. for t documentation mm -hmm. so that it can be... Uh, uh, for future yeah. research and study. We, we that, and that is, is great you made that point because I think um, religion, I, I was going to come to that, was a place of religion in promotion of languages um, in your studies and all of that. Um, have you seen that religion has a du double-edged role? On the one hand, mm -hmm. it, it, like most of the Islam and Christianity, they come to kill off the uh, practices that promote the languages, like the rituals and the different practices. That's on the one hand. But the same on the other hand, uh, at least I know that Christianity also pushes the singing of songs and all of that in the languages. Mm. Do you then, where do you think the role of um, religion lies in promotion of language is it very detrimental uh, or, or is it uh, positive uh it's a two-edged sword like you said um first of all let's establish uh, arabic for example mm. as one of the longest language and might possibly be one of the languages that may survive over time because almost all muslims all over the world use arabic in their prayers. But they don't use the 
modern Arab in their prayers. No, the Quran. Yeah. The Quran is like a decree. Okay. So nothing changes. You can't take anything from it. Yeah. So you have to re, uh, I mean, recite the verses as it had been. Okay. Not like the Bible where you have different yeah. uh, versions right, yeah. that uh, you lost the first uh, generation yeah. uh, ways of how you it was transmitted. Yes, yeah. of how it was uh, and transmitted. For Arabic, it remains as original okay. as it had been. Okay. So that's why I say to an extent, theirs will survive. survive. Yes. But for other religions like the African religion, mm. that has gone on the extinct to a very, very, I mean, large extent. For example, you have to uh, we have modernized the way the Shango practice is being done. Mm. The Oshun Oshogbo has also been modernized mm -hmm. to an extent. So you see tourists coming in. So we have to twist some things mm. to go in the ways that we want this tourist to view us. So okay. <laughs> I'd like to cut you a bit. We'll go on a break. I know, hold the thought. I know <laughs> you are coming with some interesting aspects. And um, I'll, we'll go on a break and then we'll come back. For those of you watching, please hit the subscribe button. And if you're watching on NTA, um, feel free to climb onto YouTube on your phone at www.youtube.com forward slash Aquaya TV and do subscribe. Just hold on a minute and we'll be right back on this com with this conversation. <laughs> So you're welcome back to the conversation we're having on how to keep our languages from extinction. And Salama Tusule, who is a, a poet and um, linguist, language activist, uh, has been talking about how religion uh, plays a role in uh, keeping languages alive and then how... Also destroying it in destroying a way. Destroying it in a, in a, in a sense. Um, yeah. You were talking about the Oshun Oshogbo... Festival, uh, for example. Yeah. So I was just saying to you that the Oshun Oshobo Festival, for example, may not be ideally done in that raw traditional way it used to because now it has attracted some tourists and it's now like a UNESCO site. Mm. So most of the time, a lot of things will be altered to suit the modern times. Mm. So you won't find the things that used to be there in the old times. So is there a way of documenting these phases mm. so that we can now tell how it has either helped to keep language or culture or how it has also, I mean, helped to diminish some of these uh, languages as well. Then I go also to the rituals that um, we do mm. in our different African cultures. Yeah. You don't see where someone puts some yams and some palm oils and make some incantations mm. anymore because of religion. Mm. So religion frowns at such practices. So Even though that is religion in itself. Uh, but yes, um, yes. So yeah, no, we, it's we, now like a, a conflict of one religion over the other yeah. and uh, uh, inferiority uh, complexes of uh, the two religion in itself. So your one... She Sheung Kuti, sorry to cut you. <laughs> Sheung Kuti, okay. he, he, he practices African traditional religion and he is always, um, you know, mm. at loggerheads with the Christians and Muslims who, you know, yes. um, abandon their own religion. Yes, know. yes. So, so this is the thing. So by the time we're able to also uh, keep our religion the way it is and we're able to document it before it goes on the extinct. So imagine my children comes now mm. and they know nothing about 
these practices. Mm. So they just come and see that this is how life has always been. Mm. Just like COVID happened and everybody's masking up. So in the next years to come, everybody thinks it's the normal. Mm. So we're born to live like this. So it's part of the, the fashion. So it's the same way. And I think um, it will be very disappointing mm. if we have all the technical know-how mm. to document all of this and we're not documenting it. So the message I want to leave here now is for documentation and archiving as much as possible and for also the promotion of it and the researching of it so that... Uh, we don't lose everything because it will be terrible if we do. NICO, the National Institute of Cultural Orientation, is one government agency that should be doing this. Is it doing enough? Okay. I don't want to indict them. Please don't. But if you should, do. Yeah, because um, even the Nigerian Television Authority, the Ministry of Information and what have you, what have they done in terms of propagating languages? Mm. I only see Yoruba Ibo Hausa mm. uh, being, uh, you know, instrument of communication on all of this channel, and I think it's not enough. And that's why most of what you see in the country today is because of this type of disintegration where you're marginalizing minority groups mm. as not being part of you. I think the more you give these people recognition as is due to them, the more there's unity in the country. Mm. So for example, why don't people like NICO or the NTA or the Ministry of Information, for example, challenge every culture to do an adaptation of the national anthem in their languages? Mm. Maybe we are not understanding enough yeah. what it means to say arise, O compatriots. Mm. Maybe we need to also hammer it in our individual languages yeah. so that people understand their individual responsibility to their country or their community or to themselves even. But because we're not doing any of this, then it shows that we're not ready yet. Yeah. Yeah. So marginalization is one thing that might also lead to language loss, unfortunately. Oh, that's true. That's true. In South Africa, the experience is that um, I think they have 11 official languages. That is, they have 11 languages, I think, and all the languages are official languages. Yes. Therefore, if you go to a police station mm -hmm. or you go to a hospital and you only understand one of the languages, say you are Zulu-speaking person, the, it's, the onus is not on you to speak in a language that they understand. The onus is on them to bring someone who understands your language and pay that translator. Mm. So the organization, every government organization then has to have uh, people either employed or on uh, translators on standby that can be paid either per hour and all of that to translate the languages, mm. which then at least improves inclusiveness. And then it's giving jobs to speakers of the language and you can then consciously train speakers of the different languages because you know they will find a job, government alone. Mm. And I love what um, uh, uh, Manarakis is doing in, 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 uh, in uh, Nupe language, yeah. you know, his, mm -hmm. he, the indigenous language learning center. Yes. He has, he teaches Nupe, he teaches, uh, he's even, he's expanded it to include Idoma and all of that. So I think these are the things NICO should do more of and uh, partner with organizations to do. Yes. You know there's a training on languages they do. They do, they do. Yes, so you see, even in our literatures, you find people like Ungugi Wachiongo mm. dumping his... Uh, English, name, yeah. his English name, and adopting his, uh, I mean, Swahili as his official um, form of writing. And I think... Um, Is it even Swahili or, <laughs> or Gikuyu? Or? Gokuyu, yeah. yes, Gokuyu. And then he writes in his native Gokuyu. And uh, I mean, they've also adopted Swahili as their official language. And I think it's 
a good step in that direction for writers to also begin to do that because in Nigeria here you can only find few materials on Akwea. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, when you go to the I went to the bookstore the last time and I said to myself I need to find um, linguistic materials on let's say 19 Nigerian languages for mm. example. I barely found anything close to six. Wow. Yes, because the one I, yes, the ones I found are Igbo, Yoruba, and Hausa, and that's because that's what Nigerian educational system adopted as one of the I mean tools for learning in schools. So you can only find some of these materials now, like the Igala. I know Amachonu is okay. doing a lot in Igala, Igala linguistics. He's done some things on the allophones mm -hmm. and trying to find all those verbs and nouns and all of that mm. for Igala. But then, what of other languages mm. we don't have in Akwea, we don't have? Yes, I know even in uh, Benue State, those who cannot write can actually read the Bible in yeah, Tiv. In Tiv. Uh, so for me, it's very Bible. interesting. Uh, yeah. It's very interesting. Like, yes, um, I'm not learned or mm. lettered, but I can read the Bible in tears. So if this can be a critical tool for communication, so why don't we... Why do, do we it? even require to be people to be learned, lettered in English before we say they are learned? Exactly. Because... The Chinese that produces all these things, he comes here and he can't speak a word of English. But so you are. can also tell why there's so much level of development in China mm. and all of those Asian environments because they pay allegiance. They are so very loyal to their language, either in science, either in literatures, or what have you. Mm. And you're forced to learn it. I remember how uh, Odia, uh, Odia Ofemu uh, charged us as writers and as um, scientists uh, during the uh, MBA colloquium in, uh, in Mina. Mina, yeah. He said that we should start translating, collecting the herbs, all the herbs. Yes. Collecting their names and then translating what they do in English and all of that. So but when you start documenting, when you have um, correct local names and local actions, our um, potencies of the drug written down, that that's one of the first ways. Then you go to food. Then you go to uh, dressing. Then you go to, go to songs. Songs. Now I'll tell you one interesting story. My dad's uh, younger brother used to be uh, a herbal practitioner and I remember very vividly that sometimes he will go to collect his herbs in the morning mm. because that is when the potency for that herb can really be administered on not juju no like real herbs no you know some people say when they go there so they speak some words early in the morning and then the spirits no come. no not that one just like real herbs, like for example, if you, let me use Moringa as an example. Yeah. So he, he tells you this herb can only work on you in the morning because that is when it's very strong for okay. you to take it. Mm -hmm. And then some he can't go until towards the evening mm -hmm. himself to get it. And one of the things that I didn't do at the time was to take notes. Mm. of the names of these herbs mm. and to document the time he mm. goes to collect them. Some he goes and collect them and dries them. You mm. can only take them when they are dried. Some you can only take them when they are fresh. Mm. So all of these, and I forgot to also label the trees and put the names there. So now he's late. Oh. And some of his patients still comes. And we don't know no Jack because we've not been part of what he's doing. Mm. And these are something that you can even, you know, negotiate with, you know, how about practitioners? They can then take all of this and uh, put
put it into their, um, I mean, their archives or document it like Akuya is we doing now? We don't value it. We, we would prefer to go to a shop and buy a Chinese herbal medicine that is mm. packaged in a shiny package. Yes. We want to take that one. We are not, it, it's not diabolical according to us. Mm -hmm. But if a uh, herbal medicine practitioner from Nigeria gives you some, mm. we say it is herbalist. And the name herbalist, mm. different from a traditional healer, yeah. we, don't, <laughs> we, don't, we don't look at the difference. Between them. The herbalist, it just uses herbs to heal. Yeah. And even the traditional... The other herbalists that yeah. you talk about in that sense, they are valued for what they do at yeah. their time because the kind of incantation they do, they understood nature and they could converse with birds, for example, and yeah. they could understand the shapings of the trees or the way the trees move about. So they knew what they were doing. They were just um, practitioners who are well versed about nature, yeah. but we refuse to try to understand all of that. So we killed it with our own hands, and now they've gone on the extinct. Yeah. And now these people come to research them, and they go back, and they're just like even with the hair now, uh, once upon a time we have to iron our hair hmm. just to make it look straight and all of that. Now... We have to fall back to those people who come to Africa to take the natural hair and sell some natural products to us, mm -hmm. where they took it from us, mm -hmm. and then they sell it back to us. And we're now going back to roots, saying uh, we're doing the naturalista. And I know mm -hmm. there was a time it was uh, trending. So you wonder, <laughs> these people, they come back and... Uh, give to you what you originally owned. Oh. And it's, for me, it's very sad because we don't acknowledge and we don't value what we have until someone else does it for us and then we begin to, yeah. uh, I mean, acknowledge it. Okay. So as a final word, I'm sure our time is so <laughs> far spent. Um, if you want to, how you know, if we were to list some of the points you've raised earlier, if we were to list them um, as key steps that we should take to save our languages from extinction, mm. what would be those priorities you would? Number one, I want to raise this fact that uh, we seem to be a country at conflict with each other, but we're being sold a narrative that is super wrong. Because if I go to the market and I see shegum, for example, and I say shegum baoni, shegum is likely to give me more magi that I want to buy. Uh, Hassan is willing to give me more nama because I spoke Hausa to Hassan. And uh, Chukudi is also likely to be very happy with me because I'm trying to associate with him in the language that he understands. But when you come back and you hear another narrative that uh, we, we're being disintegrated and you begin to wonder, I just left Chukudi in the market. Mm. How come I'm still at loggerhead with Chinedu? Mm. So you, you, you begin to, to, to worry. It's a cause for worry, really. I, I, so one thing I want to highlight here is that language is a very powerful tool for national integration and mm -hmm. development. I want to also highlight that we need to challenge ourselves to begin to sing our national anthem in our individual languages. Mm -hmm. I know Juliana Ogecha did something with the Igala national anthem, so mm -hmm. powerful and beautiful. Uh, and I know other languages have done such adaptation as well. Mm -hmm. So let's begin to speak in the languages that we understand rather than uh, uh, doing that thing of, uh, you know, uh, I won't say colonial thing now because um, this is globalization. You choose to uh, speak in a language that you want as your tool for massive instruction, but don't worry. It mm. can also be sa the same tool for massive destruction if you, if mm. you want. So I, I think um, we should also go to schools and begin to embrace language day. Mm. So you get kids to speak in their uh, L1 or L2, mm. 
However, L1 I, is language one, right? L1 is the first language, uh, uh, like your mother tongue. Okay. So if you're in Abuja, for example, your L1 can be your, your uh, can be English. Hmm. Yes. Or it can be Bagi. Yes, or it can be Bagi. Yeah, it will be good if it's Bagi because you're able to identify in your mother's tongue, which is a good thing. But then, then so I think schools should embrace it. Mm -hmm. So. I, I come home, I stay with mommy and daddy, learn some of these like folk songs, mm. like the ABCD. I know Amarachi Atama mm. is doing a lot when it comes to Igbo languages. Sometimes she comes to her Facebook, brings some fruits and say, hey, can you remember their names and mm -hmm. all of that? I think which is a good thing. I think UNESCO should really uh, see how they can work with her because she's done a lot in terms of collecting folk song, in terms of poetry poetry in terms of uh, food and all of that, including uh, f fashion. I think I saw right. her did something on fashion yesterday. Right. And I think Akwea TV has responsibilities mm -hmm. of documenting, of archiving, of working with institutions that matters. Mm -hmm. I know it's uh, going to, it's a painful process because this is something we ought to have been doing, but it's still very doable yeah. and we should partner with uh, research institutions as possible. I know there are few linguists home and abroad mm. who will be willing to partner with you as much as possible because this is very, uh, I mean, important that it happens. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Salama Tusule, um, author of uh, Oma, the drama. Queen. Queen. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, Oma is everywhere drumming now. Yeah. So and I we used to have uh, drumming festival, so it's a good thing. I think Akoya should tap into that. One of these days, yeah, we will tap into that. Yes. Thank you very much. And for those of you who have been with us on this conversation, it's not too late to start to speak your language with your children or your, your siblings. Just start. A language only mm. dies when it's not used. Every other thing, if you drink water, most likely the water finishes from the pot and uh, all of that. But language lives, language thrives because you are using it. If you have anything to share with us in relation to this, please put it in the comment section. Or please, as Salama Tusule has said, you can also sing the national anthem in your language and send it to us. And we're sure going to use it. We're going to put it on air. If you also cannot sing, why not say the national pledge in your language? Let's see that challenge. Thank you. I am Odo Diego Kenyudo. Thank you for being with us on this show. <laughs>